peuple nommé Dreyfus Alfred, coupable du crime de haute trahison. We're lighter, we're faster. That don't work, we're nastier. Roman Polanski tackles anti-Semitism via the historical Dreyfus affair in his latest film. Matt Damon and Christian Bale are seeking out speed on a legendary racetrack. And the very first Cannes Film Festival gets a delayed showing 80 years later. Well, that's all coming up in today's film show. And joining me to take us through it is film critic Lisa Nesselson. Hi, Lisa. Hello, Olivia. Now, we're starting with the new release from Roman Polanski, An Officer and a Spy. The story is based on the historical Dreyfus Affair, which is well known here in France. The film won the Silver Lion at the Venice Film Festival in September, and that did spark some controversy because Polanski is still wanted in the United States for having raped 13-year-old Samantha Gamer in 1977 and having left the country prior to final sentencing. Well, since then, he's been back in the headlines after a French woman named Valentine Meunier spoke up to say that Polanski raped her in Switzerland in 1975 when he was 42 and she was 18. Now, through his lawyer, the 86-year-old director categorically denied the woman's allegations and the statute of limitation has expired there. Now, this has all created a lot of debate around the film, and a screening here in Paris was actually cancelled because of protests by feminists outside the cinema. So what about the movie in all of this? Well, France is the first of 24 countries where the film will definitely get a theatrical release. And I have to say, I haven't seen every single French film made this year. There's about 300. But for me, this is the best French film of the year. The Dreyfus Affair tore the nation apart for 12 years, starting in 18 1994, French army captain Alfred Dreyfus, a Jew, was wrongly convicted of treason for passing secrets to Germany. Colonel Georges Picard, who didn't like Jews and didn't like Dreyfus, put his own career in jeopardy all the same once he found evidence of Dreyfus's innocence. The film concentrates on Picard, superbly played by Jean Dujardin, as he gets the runaround from fellow army officers who refuse to correct the error. Now, literal-minded people who need to brush up a bit on their history have written that Polanski called it J'accuse, the French title, because he's been accused accused of unsavory things. I'd like to emphasize that Jacques Hughes refers to the justifiably famous open letter that Emile Zola wrote to the president of France condemning the unconscionable judicial error and the subsequent cover-up. Zola's damning words boldly occupied the entire front page of the newspaper L'Aurore, and I have to say I burst into tears uh, when a newsboy on screen started hawking it in the streets of turn of century Paris. I was moved by the display of backbone and the once dazzling power of the press. And it was a truly important moment here in France. Well, let's take a look at an officer and a spy. J'aurai satisfaction. Va la trouver chez tes putes. Lâche. Traître. Sale juif Now, you mentioned the writer Emile Zola, and this story has inspired previous films as well, hasn't it? Oh, indeed. Going way back, Georges Méliès made a series of one-minute films about it when it was still ongoing back in 1899. And 1937's Hollywood film, The Life of Emile Zola, is a sincere biography of the writer's defense of the unfairly exiled and repudiated Captain Dreyfus. And that film won Oscars for Best Picture, Best Screenplay, and Best Supporting Actor for Joseph Schildkraut as Dreyfus. Uh, Polanski saw that film as a young person, age 14, and the scene stuck with him, in which Dreyfus is ceremonially stripped of his rank and busted down to civilian before being condemned to hard labor on Devil's Island. That's how this film begins, and the attention to detail and the emotional power of events is breathtaking. Now, Louis Garel plays Dreyfus here, and he makes a very strong impression as a rigorously principled wrong man put through uh, unimaginable suffering, but the screenplay centers on Colonel Picard. <laughs> 
Mm, uh, Colonel Picard, of course, played by Jean Dujardin, who we all remember from his starring role in The Artist. And he said this is the first time he's worked with a real maître, or a, a, a consummate master of cinema. That's- One of the reasons Polanski is such a skilled director is that the importance of the smallest of gestures was impressed upon him as a boy in Poland under harrowing circumstances. His father was arrested by the Nazis, and young Roman was about to run to his side, but his father made the delicate gesture like to let him know to stay away, and that detail may have saved his life. His mother perished in Auschwitz. His very pregnant wife, Sharon Tate, was slaughtered by followers of Charlie Manson. He couldn't control any of that. Nobody could, but he exercised complete control as a filmmaker. Now, this film is painfully pertinent on the topic of raison d'etat and also about the eternal tug of anti-Semitism. Nobody likes to admit a mistake, then or now, but at that time, in French power circles, admitting a mistake was close to unthinkable. Picard's principles oblige him to defend a wronged man, not least of all because since Dreyfus is innocent, well, that means the real traitor is still out there, possibly doing additional harm. All right, really does hit the, uh, the pillars of the French state, the institutions indeed. Well, next to another true story starring Matt Damon and Christian Bale this time. It's called uh, Le Mans 66 in French and in English, Ford versus Ferrari. I'm guessing it's about car racing. Tell us more. (laughs) Uh, I just told you about the best French film of the year. Well, this is definitely one of the best American films of the year. You don't have to care one bit about automobile design or car racing to be drawn into James Mangold's fact-based saga of how a small band of dedicated grease monkeys perfected an all-American vehicle that could give Europe's sports car dynasties a literal run for their money. Now, in a nutshell, in the 1960s, Henry Ford II was peeved that the Ford Motor Company's cars weren't fast enough to seem sexy and so, in turn, sell. He gave his staff the mission of building a car that could beat Ferrari at the punishing French race, the 24 Hours of Le Mans. He ended up turning to outsiders to give his dream heft. Okay, well, let's take a look at Ford versus Ferrari. Hey, All Bill, right. what seems to be the problem, Bill? Well, the problem is that the Bill here is an arsehole. No, he doesn't mean no, that. No, yes, he does. No, yes, he, really he does. Yes, no, that. he He's really does you, think Bill. that He's Bill is an arsehole. I'm just doing Bill, my job Bill, here. Bill, 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 in my experience, there is, listen to me, something like this, there's always a middle ground. All right, now Ken's out of line. And I'm just right. doing my job. I understand you are. You know how he gets on a race day. You know that. All right, but you're not going to DQ us over at Trump. <laughs> Now, Mangold also directed the Johnny Cash story, Walk the Line, and that action film starring Hugh Jack- Jackman, sorry, Logan, which has been called the greatest action film of all time. Now, are his wide-ranging filmmaking skills being put to good use here? Well, absolutely. This puts us in the driver's seat. It's about mechanical excellence and human foibles, about the nature of competition and how industrial pride can lead to innovation. For us to care about this stuff, it's important to understand the beauty inherent in speed and motion. And that's something we pick up along the way without being lectured to or talked down to. It feels organic. It invites us into a near mystical realm that's equal parts stubborn dreaming and pragmatic elbow grease. Now going in, I did not know the first thing about these real life protagonists, Ken Miles and Carol Shelby, and I left the screening feeling as if I'd gotten to know them and admire them. Uh, The many scenes between Matt Damon and Christian Bale give us a chance to see two superb actors playing complex characters and making their craft look easy. Uh, There's incredible suspense, heartbreak, triumph, humor, all the ingredients that make for a fun trip to the movies. And as we all get increasingly mired in algorithms and artificial intelligence and the prospect of driverless cars, and the USA manufactures fewer and fewer things because it's cheaper elsewhere, uh, this movie is a reminder of the human component in making beautiful things and coaxing the most out of them. So do not be put off by the topic of auto racing. This is an outstanding film just about any Anybody can enjoy. Okay, I was about to say, if it gets me interested in car <laughs> racing, then that's clearly quite a challenge. I'll give it a go. Now, we're going to go back even further in time to an event that should have taken place eight decades ago, and that was the first Cannes Film Festival, 1939. Now, most of us don't get second chances in life, but this will in the French city of Orléans. Tell us about it. Well, the event is called Cannes 1939. The very first Cannes Film Festival was supposed to begin on September 1st, 1939, mm. but then Germany invaded Poland. Uh, International film festivals, of course, 
now established and familiar events, but they were spanking new in the 1930s. Mussolini, for example, founded the Venice Film Festival, the world's oldest, as a showcase for fascism. So Jean Zay, who was Minister of Education in Beaux-Arts, had the idea for France to mount a sort of rival festival, a major festival attuned to democratic principles. The group that honors his memory is showing the films that would have been projected 80 years ago, and a jury will give awards in the categories that existed then. Amazing. Now, the lineup they secured is mouthwatering. 1939 may have been a rotten year in politics, but boy, was it a great year in cinema. From the U.S. alone, Only Angels Have Wings, Love Affair, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and the film I'd probably vote for, The Wizard of Oz. As would I. <laughs> now, cinema used to be what we call a soft weapon to win hearts and minds. Politicians understood the absolutely vital role played by culture in influencing populations. In fact, Lenin declared early on that the cinema was the strongest tool for moving the masses. Or movies can just be really entertaining. Okay, well that sounds like a really interesting opportunity to catch in Orléans. Thank you very much for joining us this week, Lisa. We'll leave you with a glimpse of Cannes 1939, now alive and well in the city of Orléans. Do check out our website for the latest in arts and culture, and you can keep up with us on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. I got something else to do. They don't work to the ramasses. Tell your children how the great 